Hello and welcome to the Forums podcast streaming live on Wednesday the 23rd of September. Do I need to tell you it's 2020? And joining me tonight is Steve Withers. Good shooting, soldier. Ed Selly. I've seen those finger paintings you bring home and they suck. And Kaz Harlow. You're going to die, clown. So we're streaming once again. Thank you very much for joining us if you are watching the video stream this evening. Um, it is nice to see you. Uh, yes, it is a Wednesday. It's going to take a little while to get used to being midweek rather than the Sunday evening. I'm sorry if it if it messes up your Monday. I know people have got used to their their Monday commutes or their Monday walking the dog in the morning and so on and listening to the podcast. Apologies for that, but uh, we're going to be around on a Wednesday. It's midweek. There's lots more happening or seemingly there's supposed to be lots more happening uh, that we can talk about on a Wednesday. So continue to give us your feedback. Um, let us know uh, what works for you and uh, and we'll ignore it because we're doing it on a Wednesday. <laughs> uh, if you are catching up on the podcast, uh, if you listen to the audio only version, thank you very much for listening uh, whenever you are listening. Don't forget if you do have questions for us and you don't watch us uh, live on the video, then you can send us your questions to podcast at avforums.com and we will read them out and then answer them. So uh, keep those coming in. Also remember that you can subscribe to us uh, on iTunes, Spotify and most of the larger podcast providers. If there is a provider that we're not on, let us know and we'll investigate and we'll make sure that we are on those providers so you can find us nice and easy. And also we're on YouTube so you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. The most important thing, the most useful thing that you can do for us or the most helpful thing you can do is like this video. Uh, if you're watching later in the week, if you're watching live, whenever you're watching, if you do like what we do, and you want to support us in any way whatsoever, click the like button. It really does help us. And subscribe to the channel if you do like us. Um, and Steve, what else can they do? You mean smash that um, like button? No, we've mentioned, the, we've mentioned, we've mentioned the like that? button. Oh, yeah. Subscribe. Ring like. the bell. Yeah. Oh, What's... ring the bell. Ring the bell. Ah, I see. Yeah. Got there in the end. Yeah. Old age kicking in there. He completely forgot what we were oh, talking I about. I was so not paying attention. <laughs> What's new? There's nothing new about that. Um, of course, if you do appreciate the forums, the editorial content, the videos and so on, you can, of course, make a donation if you feel inclined to do that. We've got two different ways of doing that. If you want to be a regular uh, donator and donate £3 a month, you can do that through patreon.com forward slash AV forums and become a patron. And you do get little bits and pieces that other people don't get to see, like Tom's thumbs. You get to see Tom 24 hours before anybody else does. Um, and we were going to say you get to see Tom for 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that would be cruel. That really would be cruel. Um, but yes, you do get uh, little, uh, nice little treats like that. And we will be adding to that as we go on. So, uh, so if you do become a patron, um, hopefully there will be things that we can uh, share with you that others don't get to see. Uh, and... If you want to ask a question of the team tonight, you are welcome to do that. And the best way of doing that is to make a donation via streamlabs.com forward slash AV forums. You can donate any amount you like, um, ask a question, and we will try and answer them for you this evening. We can't guarantee, but we'll give you an answer, but we'll try. Uh, and donations since we were last live, Joker, he donated five pounds. Thank you very much, Joker. He said the, way, the wife hid the remote control. We can't really help you out on that one. No, but, um, there's no immediate uh, immediate solution to that particular problem. Although, um, let's face it, most TVs are app, uh, are app driven as well. I was just going to say, most new TVs are app driven or Alexa. Shouted it. Whatever, so yeah, just Should shout be okay. it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just <laughs> incoherently yell. That's that's sh shout at the TV. I've been shouting at my TV for decades, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Depends who's on it, doesn't it? And we've got yeah, a new yeah, patron. <laughs> we've got a new patron, uh, Richard Orchard. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you, Joker. Thank you, Thank you very much for supporting us. Uh, and if you do feel inclined to support us, you are obviously uh, helping us in terms of growing AV forums, improving the site speed and features, producing more editorial content. And like I say, one day we'll we'll hit the perfect podcast for you. All right. So, what have we been doing? This week, Kaz, you look very moody there with your lighting. I always look moody. Yeah. You're like a serial killer, guys. I do, yeah, yeah. I got that serial killer thing going on, yeah. Uh, well, aside from reviewing, I went, I went to a socially distant alpaca party. A what? A what? Yeah, the birthday party. Well, the alpacas socially distant. Alpacas. Is there a limit to the number of alpacas that one is allowed? 
six now. They had to. Yes, eat, I know people. One what about what? Oh, right. But it's six alpacas as well, is it? <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> uh, there were loads of people, but everyone had a separate table. But it was interesting how you, obviously it was six. It was a family per table. But by the end of it, it was just mayhem. I mean, there were kids. Uh, people were everywhere. There was alcohol involved. It was uh, well, what, it started what, off what so, the alpacas, so well. They come into it. Yeah, they drank as well. Yeah, good, they were, good. They were, I appreciate yeah. that. They Did got you out of control. Eat the, eat the alpacas. Don't. Where they're, they're <laughs> I, I fed the alpacas though. I was quite happy doing that. Don't don't go behind them though. They do like to kick. Oh, do you um, want people sneaking no one up want behind you? Coming up behind me either, looking like you do in that picture. <laughs> yes, yes, quite well. No, I didn't do it. I just encouraged all the children to try. <laughs> kids in space <laughs> yes it was a it was an engaging party but um but yeah it was just interesting obviously this was before the the rule of six suddenly came back in but um but it's that was... the rule now i i, I, well, I know you're, I you're, can, no, no you're lucky if you get what the rules are you're now. lucky if you get those rules because obviously i live in the northeast and we're currently under restrictions at the minute so it, we've been under this shutting down everything earlier because seemingly the virus can ask can a question about that by the way why does shutting a pub an hour earlier make any difference because because the virus comes out at 10 o'clock at night yeah oh, it, is it? Oh, yeah. what, what happened That's is what that somebody in sage watched an american werewolf in london and assumed <laughs> that they were apparently the same thing so that's that's why it is and i can't wait till until the hours the hour change as well because uh, i don't know what that means for what <laughs> i do i do think that the memes on it are hilarious i've seen um the the gremlin change uh at 1001 seen loads of memes about it but the reality is that they're trying to say that people get more out of control aren't they it, they're just encouraging point. us to start drinking earlier and we i know, I know. yes so yeah. you know. I, 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 I mean try to work this out i can't think of any reason why that makes a damn bit of difference if you're like, in the pub I, for I'm, five hours even, you're in the pub for five hours yes, yes. I'm, maybe they hope people will have that hour trimmed off the end and not yeah. go uh, yeah good luck there let's go I, i'll, off I'll, I'll tell you home. what though I'm glad I don't have to make these decisions because you're damned if you do and you're oh, damned. God, no, with the, yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, and, and what they're trying to do, and you can understand this, is they're trying to keep the economy going. Um, yes. They, they don't Because if you close pubs and hospitality and all the rest of it, everything you've done over the summer to try and generate that that business again is is going to fall flat. And so I understand it, but it is a, I don't understand the 10 o'clock rule. I really don't. Um, People mingling in houses and so on, or visiting households and so on. I get that. I understand that. Um, but, you know, you can't go and see, oh, well, certainly the restrictions I'm under, I can't go and see family members, but I can go to the pub with 30 other people indoors. Well, it sounds really like you need to meet in a pub then, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, yeah, doesn't it? That's but, the uh, <laughs> Uh, in terms of what I've been doing this week, uh, because I've been under lockdown and so on, I've kind of just cracked on and tried to get um, all the work done that I, I've got here. So I just set these TVs up last week behind me. Uh, the Sony is going back on Friday. I just need to film that tonight. That review will be done. We're going to talk about the Panasonic review, which I've just finished writing today. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. And then I've got the 43-inch, 43, 48-inch um, C10 from LG and I've got some firmware to try on it um, because of the feedback that we gave them about floating blacks and black flashing and so on. They have sent some firmware through. I'm going to try that when I get around to uh, testing that TV, which will be later this week into next week. And then I've got an 8K TV coming from Samsung and a 4K TV coming from Samsung. So those will be the following week. We've just got the Philips 935 to see. Um, and then I think that's it in terms of editor's choice this year. I think I'll have seen all the TVs by then. So that's what I've been doing. I've been working. I've been playing with Dirac for the first time. So that may surprise some people, but I, I actually, Steve always used to get the, the good AVRs in. For the, <laughs> um, I haven't seen Anthem's um, version of the, the room correction in Dirac. I had, ARC, and I hadn't, had never played with Dirac until this week. And I've got to say, I really like it. Um, the interface with the NAD, it is restricted because it's live. It's not the full thing, so it only goes up to 500 hertz. So it does 20 hertz to 500 hertz, which is mainly the area that you want to correct anyway within, within rooms. Um, reflections and so on, you can correct them, them in other ways. And I know my room particularly well, so those are never going to be an issue. What I like, though, is the fact that I could mess about with it. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, and then have load the filter. 
in real you time. Limitless self confidence. You can, you know, set your own targets and believe that you know better than the audio industry. It's all, all yeah. quite impressive. Well, so, to, to be honest, uh, it did, the first two measurement cycles I did were not great. For, for whatever reason, they weren't great. But the fact that I could go in, and because it was too much in the, in the mid section of the, uh, of the audio, it was, it, was, it was just pushing it too high. And it, it added coloration to the speakers, which it shouldn't yeah. do. Um, so, yeah, I had, to do, I had to run it twice to get it to, so it was working nice. And obviously, that was in a, an area where I couldn't correct it uh, because it was over 500 hertz. But, but yeah, it's, it's a good system. It, it's very much like all the others. I do like the time alignment that it does uh, mm -hmm. and going in and seeing what, what time alignment it's adding to the speakers. Just out of interest, I just thought that was that was mm -hmm. interesting. So, so, yeah, it's a good little system. I've enjoyed playing about with it. I'm going to play about with it a little more and then um, I'm going to have to get around to, do, to doing these reviews. I've been putting them off, but mainly because I've had loads of TV. So it's been work, work, work for me. Um, haven't been able to get out in the car. And even if I could... Under the new restrictions, I'm, I'm not really supposed to be mingling with people. So so there we go. Uh, Ed, what have you been doing? Um, I did mingle. I saw my brother for the first time since February uh, at the weekend. He came over to see me. Uh, uh, as you might imagine, we're both... At Where the, does he uh, live then? He lives in um, East London, South, South East London at the moment. Um, so he came to see me. Um, we basically just sat, listened to music, argued about music did some food you know sort of standard things you might it's sort of what i do on my own just with another person yeah, I was going to say, like that me. sounds like an average day for you yeah it was just, you know uh, didn't break any new ground um he uh did point out um that my car i mean i don't pay much attention to the outside of my car as long as it's still attached it's it's fine but he pointed out that it was actually <laughs> sticky to the touch so i broke the habit of a lifetime and for the first time since i took delivery of it in june i had it washed um, some, uh, some, some lovely. Yeah, I, I did make the mistake of saying you washed your car. You didn't wash your car. You no, 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 no. Yeah. I, I, um, I, um. So it'd be tree sap that was on it then. It was tree sap. So it's about thirty kilos lighter because all the tree sap's <laughs> off it. So that that's good. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that that's all done. And obviously, it's now being rained on, so uh, that makes no difference at all. Um, I have. How, how sad is it though? It's been chucking it down today, and every now and again, I've been putting my glasses on, going over at the window, and looking at the beading on my car and how the water's just coming off the, the car. Yeah, uh, the, uh, we, we, the this is a, we, we, we've been careful about the profanities we can use. So there is a word I would intersperse into the sentence normally, but that is tragic. I mean, <laughs> tragic. Sad bastard was the word I was thinking of. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Hey, funny. I fully admit it. I enjoy it though. Um, uh, otherwise, I too have been um, working um, after well, there's been some spendy products in some of my reviews of late. Uh, it's a good clutch of sensibly priced things from brands that people have heard of in the in the offing for this set. So um, I've been working my way through those. Um, I haven't been watching any television. Um, I was just saying before we went on, uh, I did watch some television last night, which is a 23 year old episode of A Cook on the Wild Side on uh, More 4. So I'm well up to date with my telly. Um, and uh, otherwise, yes, yeah, it's, it's basically trying to understand the exciting new government rules. Um, which I don't think I'm doing terribly well at. I mean, I think I've got people from two different pe two people are coming over to my house tomorrow night for a curry, and they're coming from different houses. And I don't know if that's allowed or not, but we'll see. So that's if, uh, if you're not in a lockdown restriction area, then rule of six, it should be fine. I yeah, I think so. That's the case. So yeah, I mean, we're all very large, but there are still only three of us. So I think you know, it's, if it's not done on a mass calculation, we should be fine. At um, least, uh, at least Steve Dr in the chat uh, on on the uh, on the video feed is saying he likes beading as well. So at least there's two side bars. Oh no no no! There, there's oh, a I like the look. Of it. it looks lovely when you there's see. There's a keen car, fraternity of of, of of car cleaning people on um, on 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 the forum. I've seen their thread. The only thing that I have to admit, um, I do find a pet peeve. It's a linguistic one. Is people who uh, use the words clean and well maintained interchangeably because you can have an immaculately maintained car which looks like a giant woodlouse and you can have something which is very clean which is not roadworthy they are not the same things so uh you know aside from that you you do you if you want to shampoo your car every weekend you shampoo yeah your car. i mean i i don't get I, if i had a driveway there wouldn't be any paint left on the car because that's what i would i would clean the car all the time i like my car to be clean but because i'm parked on the street and I don't have that. I 
I got the coatings put on, so I've got uh, G Technic coatings on it, and uh, and yeah, it, it beads up and it's great because you go in the car wash, Ed, put a couple of quid in, give it a quick uh, hose down, and it takes all the dirt off, and I can maintain it like that, and hand wash it once a month, and it's and it's. Well, I mean, in fairness, what I did was hand the Eastern European gentleman eight pounds. I then went to HMV, <laughs> bought some records. I went to TK Maxx for the first time in. Ages. I thought there'd be records involved somewhere. Well, of course there are, but I also went to TK Maxx. I bought a jumper, and it's in the great tradition of TK Maxx because it's a bargain, and it almost but not quite fits. Uh, so I've got a bit more, a bit more man <laughs> so, boob to lose. So. All right, so you're not growing into it. You need to. Oh no, I need. It, I, I need to. I need to keep 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 shedding down. So, no, as I say, business as usual, if you like, uh, which is as as much as you can say in this unsettled world. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, let's move on to... We haven't asked what Steve's what, done. because No, no, we know what Steve's done. Steve's sat in the house and watched... Oh, I can't, I, I, I've um, I killed some more people in the last week, though. So there you go. Really? What? <laughs> um, I, uh, two weeks ago, I, was, I, w- I watched Forrest Gump. So I was reading about the author, Winston Groom. He died this week. Oh, right. Uh, I see. And then I watched um, Conan the Barbarian. And uh, I was reading about Ron Cobb, who was a production designer on that. And he died this week. He was also <laughs> Star-, Star Wars, wasn't he? He was a big... Uh... Ron Cobb. Uh, Star Wars, Alien, Aliens. Uh, he was a production designer on Conan the Barbarian. He did stuff on The Abyss. He did the production design for The Last Starfighter. He was, uh, yeah, it was an absolute legend. Um, sadly, he passed away this sadly, week. Sadly, no, Steve thought... expressed an interest in his existence, and yeah. he ceased to be. I think we need to take Steve's computers off him. <laughs> Restrict his internet access. Well, fair enough, but at least um, I, I, n- none of those people sound young to me. No, no, none of them were. <laughs> uh, Winston Green wasn't that old, but uh, but Ron Cobb was in his eighties. Um, yeah, yeah. I well, mean, people. I mean, it's not like nineteen. It's like twenty not like twenty sixteen, where you had people dropping dead in their fifties. No, that was a hell of a year, that wasn't it? Mm. Really. Well, yes, it would appear that David Bowie was. Well, I think twenty twenty is not too hard to be a classic, yeah. but <laughs> David Bowie was holding the fabric of the universe together. Yeah, no, was. He died, it was gone to pot since Bowie died. That's basically <laughs> the way it's worked out. So yeah, fair enough. But yes, there we go. I'm I'm delighted to hear that. Um, uh, as long as I did Steve get my is... um, my copy of um, finally turned up my copy of David Bowie from seventy four from the latter part of the Diamond Dog Store, which was great. Also, another Bowie a Bowie CD that I actually ordered while we were doing last week's podcast because I noticed it on Amazon. <laughs> And that turned up, which is good. And also, I got my my CD and Blu-ray of the um, of Nick Mason's Source of Secrets, most recent. Uh, what tour. the thing at Camden Roundhouse? Yeah, I thought that was absolute shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm heard it yet. <laughs> yeah, um, but... I'm still I'm still waiting on my John Williams Dolby Atmos turning up from Dolby. I, it, it's three weeks now, and it's it just hasn't turned yeah, up. I might have to end up that. buying it. To be honest, uh, don't think I'm going to get a screener. Fair enough. Well, see how it goes. But uh, well, no, that's all good. Sounds like we at least we've been buying physical media in our various forms. So that's all good. Excellent. So Hooray. we've all been buying it. You can win it. Uh-huh. And Kaz uh-huh. is going to tell you all about the competitions. Sure. You can win a copy of the limited edition A Trip to the Moon Blu ray box set. It's actually a really nice prize. It looks gorgeous. It's a 50 quid, quid box set. And uh, that closes 16th of October. You can win a copy of The King of Staten Island. That closes 9th of October. That's on Blu-ray. You can also win copies of Criterion September titles on Blu-ray, which includes Safety Last, Showboat, and Beau Travail. That closes 6th of October. All competitions are open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. And we've got some previous competition winners. Jock Good. and Roll won the podcast-exclusive competition prize of 21 Bridges on Blu-ray. And Garrett won Deathstroke, Knights and Dragons on Blu-ray. Okay, good stuff. So that's competitions. That's what you can win. We'll be back in a sec with some hardware. So we're back with some hardware. I didn't get my key in the year, by the way. Um, So, uh, Ed, we're going to come to you first. Oh on God! This. Okay, fine. Um, normally, I'll talk about TVs, but we'll, we'll wait on that because there's some questions as well about soundbars, and Steve's going to talk about soundbars. So, why don't you kick us off with the Arkham SE30? Yes, I mean, I suppose we could have segued more effortlessly from the Dirac experiences that you were having 
the direct experiences. I'll that think I've of had. that when Phil mentioned it. <laughs> but we didn't because, as you say, we're shooting for the perfect podcast, and tonight is not it. Um, so uh, yes, Arcam's SA30. This um, is Arcam's flagship stereo amplifier, um, which in 2020 terms is not that expensive it's two thousand pounds list and we've looked at a clutch of amplifiers at rather more than that over the course of this year um and none of them in specification terms can get that close to the arcam uh you could legitimately describe this as an all-in-one system um uh and arcam describes it as an inintelligent integrated amplifier so make of that what you will um you get obviously standard amplifier stuff there's four line inputs uh, a clutch of stereo digital inputs after that it starts getting a bit cleverer because there is hdmi arc uh, which slaves the volume to your television uh, wakes the unit up when you turn your television on uh, there is a upmp module uh, which has both arcam's own streaming hardware and can operate as a rune endpoint um, and then all of this is tied together with uh, dirac uh, which is the full fat Dirac, um, which does, you know, 20 hertz all the way to 20K um, as, as the standard part of the license and uh, comes supplied with microphone and all, and all the other niceties. Um, I don't want to talk too much about the Dirac bit because I've done that in the review. Uh, I've put the graphs up of what I saw and so on and so forth. Um, I think what's much more important about this amplifier is it really feels like a properly inspired piece of Arcam engineering because you do get the, I, I, you know, there have been products I've looked at over the last couple of years where I sort of felt they were phoning it in, uh, in stereo terms. It felt like a lot of the effort was going on the AV receiver program and the stereo products just, just sort of ticked along. This is, you know, this is essentially a company which has long had convenience as a by a by a sort of integral part of what they do. Um, and reminding everyone who have been sort of, you know, nicking some of our cams clothes in terms of convenience that you can, that they know things thanks to the AV receiver program that they can't necessarily be matched at. So the kicker is, if you wanted to summarize the performance, if you compare it to something like the name Nate XS3, which I've reviewed earlier this year, in my room, which is like Phil's, it's been something which I have worked on. Uh, it is a benign space with correct speaker positioning and so on and so forth. In those circumstances, listening to them as a stereo amplifier, I prefer the name. The thing is, the moment that the speaker positions start to become less than optimal, the moment that you are dealing with suspended floors, the moment that you are trying to deal with an L-shaped room or things like that, the Arcam just strolls away from almost anything else in the price point because it has the ability to bend the room to its requirements and that makes a huge difference so i've you know pointed out you know that there are alternatives which i you know in in a decent well set up benign room i prefer but the thing and i point this out in the conclusion about the arcam is that i know it will work for 99 out of 100 people that try it it will deliver a performance close to what arcam anticipate from it and it does that whilst offering an absolutely magnificent specification so you know that that's that's all the good points there are some less good points um the menu system um, is, you know, like those choose your own adventure books you used to have as a kid, you know, where mm -hmm. it's like, if you want to do this, go to page 48. Are you talking you about to... on screen menus or, or on the display menu? On the display books. menus. On the display, <laughs> display menus. Menu. Right. They are it, changing the phono stage from moving magnet to moving coil. One setting change. I think it took me four minutes, some shouting. Uh, it's just, it, it's just, it, it's where our cam becomes arcane. They are unbelievable for stuff like that. It's just, it's something where simply inviting a normal person into the development process would have gone, that's rubbish, change it. And it would have <laughs> made the product immeasurably better. Um, I don't necessarily regard our cam's music life app as being top of the tree. 
but it is stable. It does work. It does offer gapless playback. Um, it has decent streaming service integration. So there's nothing. It, it, it's perfectly capable. It's just not necessarily inspired. I mean, using it as a root endpoint is obviously significantly better, and it means you can tie the volume functionality in as well. It's all all very good, but Rune obviously has expenses of it of its own. Um, and I do have to admit that in the in the interests of, of of honesty, I did make it fall over to the extent where it needed a factory reset, um, which Arcam I, they've taken the fault report and they'll, they'll hopefully look at it and making sure that I don't manage to um, that, that that's not something that the owners are replicating. But I do like it very very much. Uh, it's because it does more things than some rivals. There are more things to pick up on, but it does a huge amount. I mean, you know, little things. The phono stage is brilliant, and both for moving magnet and for moving coil. So if you're dealing with some of the Riga turntables that we've looked at this year, and like with the moving coil cartridges, you can't connect those directly to a name or a Riga amp, but you can connect them directly to the Arcam. Um, they've done their homework. It's a very 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 good product. It can you know, possibly could benefit from one more software tweak to just improve some of the some of the um, the detail functionality. But otherwise, I thought it was brilliant. Okay, good stuff. And what what's the price on that, Ed? Two grand. Okay, and and you said that it has the full Derek. So what's this is something I didn't understand because obviously I haven't looked at products with this on. So yeah, Nad only gave you the the basic fifty to uh, sorry twenty, 20 to, to five hundred. Yes, yeah. this um, is twenty to twenty. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you don't um, have to pay any extra. You get no, it. no. That yeah. is standard with with our. Anything you got to pay extra for is a base management. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the add-on. And interestingly, Arcam have been working with um, Dirac long enough that, as well as the Dirac target curve, um, you can. There's a Harman luxury target curve. The, the curve is not luxury. It's a curve from Harman luxury. Um, that is, I have to say, it's a slightly more benign benign effect than the Dirac down the line um, target. Um, I did say I wasn't going to say too much about Dirac. The only thing I do find, and it's interesting because obviously it's a factor of having the full 20 to 20. Once you get much beyond 500 hertz, it's not just correcting the room, it's correcting the speakers. Now, I know that you Miller and Chrysler boys were going, well, there's nothing on my speakers to correct, but I don't know if it's as simple as that. Using the Focal uh, canters, which live here as review speakers, they are phenomenally accurate. But nevertheless, it was trying to tinker with the actual balance of the Focals themselves. Um, ironically, I found that it worked best when I was listening to records. Um, it, yeah, actually, the Dirac <laughs> curve, the Dirac curve when using the Phono stage was really impressive. I was less... I found myself switching it in and out, which is incredibly easy to do. So it's not like it's a hard thing. I found myself switching it in and out more when I was using it as a, as a digital streaming source. Okay. Good stuff. Um, that review will be up this week, although I see the reviews on that page that Stuart's loaded up. So hopefully it's it's not shown at the minute. No, no, that's the, um, that's the detail sheet. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, good. <laughs> I was panicking there. I thought people were... Get an advanced. Remember, we know the first we, time we, that's happened. We well, no, it's because it's because that happened. We've now corrected the system. So if you search for products that we've got upcoming, you can find clues about what we're looking at, but you won't see the actual content itself. Yeah, good. I'm glad you've checked that. Right, we're going to move on to soundbars, and Steve's going to talk about another soundbar. But before we do, we have had a donation and a question about soundbars. So uh, the donation comes from Defiant Three Hundred Six. He's donated five pounds. Thank you very much. It is appreciated. And his question, Steve is mm -hmm. HWQ950T soundbar is 50% off the price. If you purchase a Samsung TV uh, after TV sale, is it worth paying 750 to £800? Pounds? Definitely. I mean, it's good value. I, I thought it was good value at, um, at twice that price. So, uh, I mean, you're getting a hell of a soundbar for that kind of money. I mean, you're getting 9.1.4 channels, GTSX and Dolby Atmos, EARC. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's a cracking price. So if you're going to be buying a TV anyway, then uh, then I think I, I would, and you, and you obviously don't have a sound system already, then uh, then if you're looking for a really immersive experience in your front room, that will deliver the goods in spades. Okay, and he also asks, 2019 75-inch Q90R at two grand versus the 2020 Q90T. I think you looked at the 95T, didn't you, Steve? But they're, they're basically yeah, I, the same well, TV. I, 
Q90R um, has more zones. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, it, if you were this, asking me, I'd say 90, the Q90R, definitely. Yeah, no, the, 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 the last year, the flagship 4K and flagship 8K TVs uh, were essentially the same apart from the resolution. Yeah. Um, this year, there are significant differences. For example, the uh, the, the top uh, 4K TVs don't have uh, 10-bit panels. They're 8-bit plus 2 dither. dither. Yeah. So um, so the, the Q90R is a seriously well-specced 4K TV yeah. Yeah. Uh, with nearly 500 zones um, and uh, you know, 10-bit panel and all that stuff. So uh, if that's what you're looking at, um, that's definitely a good buy. Yeah, there's one sitting next to me right here. 65 inch Q90R. Um, yeah, it, as far as it goes in terms of um, 4K from from Samsung, it's probably one of the last. I, I was, that was their, their last great 4K yeah. TV before they started to retry and push consumers to buy the 8K TVs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there you go. I think uh, hopefully that answer uh, is, is suitable for you. Um, right, we need to move on. So, Steve, you've been looking at a Sony yeah. soundbar. It's the Sony HT G700 soundbar, um, 450 quid. Um, and it's a, it's a 3.1 channel soundbar, but it does support Dolby Atmos and DTSX. It's also got EARC, Bluetooth, and uh, a fairly complicated menu system that you access using the, the uh, front display. Um, it's, it's, I should stress that whilst it does support uh, Atmos and DTSX, it, doesn't, it uses psychoacoustic processing. In other words, it uses sonic trickery to uh, create a more immersive experience, but it's only got three Point one channels. So there's no upward firing drivers, no side firing drivers, none of that sort of stuff. It uses circuit acoustic processing, which can be effective, but is never as compelling or as believable as actual drivers bouncing. I mean, ideally, obviously, what you'd want are speakers on the ceiling, speakers at the sides, but being practical here in someone's lounge, um, the no normal approach for the soundbar particularly is to use um, sound projection where you bounce sounds off the ceiling, bounce sounds off the side walls, rear walls to create a more immersive experience and whilst that's not perfect it is quite often very effective depending on your room of course um psychoacoustic psycho psycho processing uh creates a, a greater sense of immersion but it's never as compelling or as believable but it may i mean depending on how much you've got to spend and how much room you've got this could be a really good choice because it it does sound great it sounds really good uh, it sounds great there's three channels um and also with music with two channels uh the subs are quite beefy uh, and well integrated and the psychoacoustic processing does actually create this sort of. If you close your eyes, you so you can feel like the rain is above you. That the, the it's, it kind of feels like it's creating a, a, a sort of a, a, an aura around the TV, sort of where the sound is coming from places where it, you don't know it isn't necessarily because you know where the soundbar actually is. So it does work. And you've been to, in some demonstrations with me, Phil, mm. where we've listened to this, and, and it can be quite quite effective. Just don't go go in expecting it to be as good as um as some of the more expensive soundbars where they're using actual speakers, um you know drivers firing up at the ceiling or a system that actually uses speakers in various places in the room. But like I say, for a, a smaller room and for 450 pounds, you are getting a really good, solid, well-made soundbar that does sound very good. And the the sort of the psychoacoustic processing, the, the sense of immersion that it creates is, is definitely there. Um, um, and, you know, I, I think most people would, would find that to be quite a pleasurable experience uh, when they're watching movies, particularly. Um, but you obviously don't you need, to, you need to go in with your expectations managed because um, it will never sound as good as the, uh, the more immersive. No. No, the, the, the thing is, if you if you've got nothing behind you generating sound, you ain't going to hear anything from no. behind you. I mean, you, you, can, you can spend two grand on that Sennheiser and it's bouncing sounds all over the shop. But, you know, there's still any speakers behind you. <laughs> don't go expecting <laughs> surround channels. But what it, don't, yeah. but it does bring the sound out it gives it more more presence more more of a sort of a three-dimensional nature to it so it's almost like an aura around the tv of sound that's the best way i can describe it like a, a yeah. sound aura around the tv so the sounds certainly feel like they're coming you know they're, they're, they're filling more space than you would normally expect three speakers at the front of the room to do so it does work definitely works but um you need to be you need to manage your expectations as far as you know atmos and dtsx are concerned but you know it's got earc as well it's, it's got it's well specified and um, and uh, it's, I think I thought I've, I've got to say I thought it was a cracking little soundbar. And if you're in the sub five hundred pound bracket, it's definitely worth considering. What's the actual cost on that, Steve? Four fifty. Four fifty. Okay. Probably shop around on that one. That's that's the list price. Yeah, and that's. Am I right in thinking that's the first Sony soundbar you've seen for a couple of years? Then a while, a while. Yeah. Yes. 
Um, I can't say they've changed much. They look pretty similar to the ones I saw a couple of years ago. <laughs> to be fair, there, there, is a, there are limits to the... Uh, to, yeah, to I mean, the soundbar is a soundbar, yeah. ultimately. Well, uh, the, you, you say that, Steve, right? And uh, I've been expecting a soundbar turning up this week because we're, we're going to make a video about one of the sound, LG soundbars. So I'm expecting this soundbar to turn up. Which, which oh, one? It's the top of the range one, the SN11. 11R. 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 RG. So it turned up during the week. Uh, the guy gave me a phone and says, oh, I'm outside with your sound bus. So I was expecting just a sound bus. I wasn't oh, no, expecting. No, 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 no. Jesus, the size of the box it comes in. It was like, it's, does this include the TV as well? Does it? It's like huge box. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's the first one I've seen that that's uh, actually multi-channel with with speakers and so on. With so uh, wireless rear speakers and wireless. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm going to yeah. enjoy setting it up. I'm actually going to set it up in the cinema room. And do some experiments with an actual Atmos system versus the the sound bar with yeah that'd be stuff. interesting. Can you so um is your your sitting room's not treated then? Is, is the ceiling and that sort of stuff? The ceilings are not treated, no. So it should be fine bouncing off bounce the ceiling. That's fine, yeah, it? it's just it's a little bit higher. It's like in this room, the ceilings are about eight and a half feet, so it is a little bit high ceiling wise, but uh, it's nice and flat, so it should bounce no problem. So it'll be interesting just yeah, doing an a, a, comparison, a B comparison yeah. just to see. You know what are you losing versus a, uh, a a huge big sound system with actual speakers on the ceiling and so on versus a sound bar and a couple of your speakers. I think when when you test. consider the price and the and the convenience, you'll be quite surprised at how good they sound. Yeah, no, looking forward to that. Right, so that's the Sony HT G seven hundred. The review will be up um, probably oh, late late this week, maybe in, in next. It, yeah, <laughs> so it's going to be this week. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be next week at the earliest then, because end it'll be end of the month. So yeah. Oh, yeah, end of the month next week. Oh, we're flying through. Right, uh, so I'm just going to quickly cover the Panasonic uh, HX800 LCD TV. Uh, it's the one that I've been reviewing this, well, writing up the review this week. Uh, it was on test uh, two weeks ago. So, um, again, it's a it's an edge-lit VA panel, LCD TV, 58 inches that I looked at. Uh, it has the HCX processor, but it's not the same processor that's on the OLEDs. Basically, um, a lot of the technology that is on the OLEDs doesn't find its way down to the LCD TV lineup. So there's no filmmaker mode and there's no Dolby Vision IQ on the HX800. Um, but there is Dolby Vision, there's HDR10, there's HDR10 Plus and HLG Hybrid Gamma. Um, so it's quite well equipped in that way. It's very, very similar to the TCL that I reviewed um, recently. Um, same screen th thickness because it's edge lit very very similar in terms of performance so with it being edge lit um what manufacturers tend to do is they tend to peg back the peak brightness because if they put too much peak brightness through uh, the panel with an edge lit uh design you're going to get lots and lots of issues um so they tend to peg the, the brightness back in terms of uh, hdr and so on so it was 311 nits um and the 1% was slightly lower than that because obviously there's global panel dimming on the TV. You can't switch that off. You can switch the, uh, what they call local dimming, but it's not you know, real local dimming behind the panel. You can switch that off, but in terms of the global panel dimming, it's there all the time, which did cause a little bit of black crush, uh, basically because um, at 10% stimulus, 20% stimulus, um, the gamma was measuring around 2.7, 2.8. So it was causing a little bit of crush because of that. Uh, but obviously the flip side to that is it, it looks quite dynamic with uh, SDR content. HDR content, um, obviously you're not going to get the the peak brightness that you're going to get from uh, the best OLEDs and certainly not the, the, the better LCD TVs, but the better LCD TVs other than the Hisense um, U8 are a lot more expensive, probably double the price um, for, for the really high performing ones with HDR. So the fact that it is a little bit pegged back with the HDR performance, I didn't think it, it impacted too much like the TCL C815 that I reviewed last week. Um, overall contrast performance was around about 4,500 to 1. Um, that was with everything switched off. Um, obviously, we switch stuff on. It was a little bit better, but... Interestingly, if you switch the adaptive backlight control off, you got better peak brightness with HDR content, which seemed to be counterintuitive a little bit. So um, remember to switch that off if you want the best uh, or the most amount of, uh, of performance with HDR stuff. Um, apologies, but one of the light bulbs behind me is just blown, so hopefully you can still see me. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, so you you know what to expect with an edge lit TV when it comes to HDR performance. It's not going to be, you know, it's not going to blow you away in terms of peak brightness and so on. But it's it's measured, it's balanced. Um, there are issues with edge the edge lighting. If you're watching in a pitch black room, you are going to see clouding. Uh, you're going to see dirty screen effect. Um, the the bottom of the panel on the, this review sample was brighter in the corners than the top of the panel. Again, watching in pitch black. Put a little bit of ambient light in, so a normal living room, um, like the room behind me with the lights on and so on. Um, less noticeable, obviously. Um, the only other thing with this Panasonic was it was a sheet of glass that's on the front. So it's basically a mirror. Even switched on, it's like a mirror. Um, so any ambient light coming into the room from a window or whatever, um, the, the panel's just not bright enough to combat that. So careful placement of this TV um, is required. In terms of SDR, it was really quite accurate. True cinema was the best mode, which is normally the case if you don't have uh, the THX ISF or, um, or the filmmaker mode on board. So it was fairly accurate out of the box. Because um, at this price point, you're not going to get a, a professional calibrator in. So you want it to be as accurate as possible. And, and it was, uh, dental Es were under three. So unless you, you've got a really uh, professional eye in terms of image quality, you're not going to notice any any issues whatsoever with the color gamut or the grayscale. Um, the downsides, um, not a lot other than it's an edge lit TV and, and it's an LCD. So you're going to have the, the normal issues that you have there. Uh, no HDMI 2.1. Um, it does have low latency mode and it was a I think it was 15 milliseconds, if I remember correctly, um, which is quite good. So it's quite fast, but it doesn't have any of the uh, HDMI 2.1 features that the uh, the LG OLEDs and stuff will have. But again, you're looking at £999 for this, for a, a 57, if, sorry, 58 inch. So um, very, very close to the TCL. Scores identical to the TCL, and the review will be up this week on that one. So that's the Panasonic. HX800. Um, there are uh, higher models in the lineup, but for reasons I don't know, I won't be getting samples of those. I don't think uh, Panasonic has the samples. So, um, and that's the same with the um, the HZ980, which is their entry level OLED. Um, it is a different panel to the other OLEDs this year, and they don't have a review sample, so uh, we won't have a review of that. But anyway, that's the Panasonic. That's all the Panasonic screens we've reviewed this year, so we've covered mm. them all now. Um, so yeah, uh, good little TV. Um, little fifty-eight inch. TV. <laughs> well, it is because I just reviewed a sixty-five before it, so it was. I know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in terms of that, I mean, assuming for a non, you know, a non-critical installation would you go for the bigger bang for your buck tcl or the panasonic that's a, it's a difficult it's question it's one same. it's one i've been asking myself because obviously you've also got the u7 qf from hisense which actually has a fouled backlight but again it's not very bright i think it's 500 nits from that um again it has uh, vida for its smart tv panasonic has their uh home screen, home screen. version four or five uh, i think it's four on this one yeah, the TCL has Android TV and it works and it works well and it's got loads more applications and so on. Mm. Um, the Panasonic's got free view play, the TCL's got free view play. Um, the the TCL is cheaper and bigger, so and the performance is very, very similar. Um, so it's not like the OLEDs where you can look at a Panasonic OLED and and it, and, and it has that cinematic film look. Um, the, the Panasonic uh, LCDs don't quite have that. They do have the the loot built in, the lookup table built in. Yeah. Like I say, it's quite accurate out of the box, but the TCL wasn't too bad out of the box either. So they're very, very close. It's going to come down to what you're actually looking for at the end of the day um, and what ticks your boxes. But uh, as as living room TVs, the Hisense, the TCL, the Panasonics, um, they're all very, very good. The disappointing thing is that the Hisense U8 uh, QF if its local dimming algorithm was less aggressive than it is, where it actually switches off when it, get, it gets to a certain brightness level, it'd be a stunking TV. Um, it'd be a cracking TV for all the you know the picture quality that you're getting from it. Unfortunately, the 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 local dimming algorithm is too aggressive. So uh, fingers crossed that Hisense take the feedback on board and do something about that because 
then you're talking about a real sort of game changing TV at that price point. Whereas TCL still haven't brought in a, a fouled TV yet into the UK. The the eight one five is the is the highest TV that I think is coming into the UK so far this year. So, um, so yeah, they're, they're all round about the same price, all round about the same performance. If if High Sense could fix their local dimming, then they might actually change things up at that that level of the market. Fair enough. That's all good. Um, so that kind of almost wraps up. We're way ahead of time again. This well, no, week. we've got no. We have hardware questions which we mustn't lose. Yes, now. yes. So, so, so that's we've got what I'm Ken's to. question, which I've committed to memory because it's disappeared from the bottom of the um, the the screen. And it paraphrasing Ken, uh, if you feel feel free to, to to wade in if you feel I'm not paraphrasing it correctly, with a UHD Blu-ray, is it going to look better? in HDR terms on something like an LG CX with Dolby Vision, let's say it's a Dolby Vision encoded HDR uh, disc, or will the better, you know, max brightness of a Samsung LED, admittedly just working with HDR10, uh, out, outperform it? Or is that right. a- it's, a, it's a tricky one because what, you, what you're looking at is... Um, Two different ways of doing it and and strengths in both camps um the strength in favor of the oled is the fact that um you have a pixel that is completely black next to a pixel that is completely white um so on a per pixel basis the dynamic range of the oled is significant uh and of course it's not relying on local dimming so you can have an absolute black next to peak white um, next to each other, and you don't get any blooming. You don't get any uh, yeah, lighting up of, of a, a certain pixel area. level. It's yeah. pixel so it's, level. It's like so having it's... eight million dimming zones. Exactly. Yes. And and what the Samsung's trying to do with its backlight is it's trying to mimic that, but without having eight point three million pixels. You know, it's impossible for for it to have that. So. Um, Obviously, the, the downside with OLED is the fact that color volume is, isn't as great because you don't have the brightness to, to fill out the color volume. Um, and, of course, like I say, brightness, you're looking at 900 nits as being uh, peak brightness. Now, that doesn't mean that the OLED is dim because the vast majority of content that you're watching is still round about 100 to 200 nits. You know the the bits that are added on with with HDR, and this is only if the creator intends it to have a thousand nits or not in peak brightness. Because what you will notice is that a vast majority of films are nowhere near that. And certain directors of of photography and so on, and I'm thinking of um, um, quite a few who uh, did uh, blockbusters recently and so on, don't like HDR. The 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 don't go for an HDR grade. So they'll be around about 200 to, to 300 nets in terms of their peak brightness and so on. So that's from the OLED point of view, that's the whole the Hollywood side of things. So let's look at Samsung and other um, approaches that are on the market. When you see it done right with the right content mastered or, or, or done, uh, graded in a certain way that benefits HDR on a bright panel, there's no beating the fact that, that the peak brightness and the brightness of the panel makes a difference. It just looks more realistic. You don't have the black levels to fall back on because what it has to do is it has to shut down and it doesn't shut down on a per pixel basis. It actually shuts areas of the screen down. So sometimes you'll get a vignette and type effect around objects that you wouldn't get on an OLED because it'd be really precise. So you have to take that is one side against the other side, whereas you, you're you're getting the full effect of, of the peak brightness. But I keep coming back to a demonstration we had a, a number of years ago, uh, probably three or four years ago now, with the Sony 10,000 nit display. And it wasn't a case of standing there and getting a suntan. It was a case of it was expressing the image in such a way that it looked realistic. It looked real. The, the way that the lighting came across, whether it was a, a shot of the strip at night as you were flying down the strip and the, the neon lights and everything else, or uh, a car sitting under the lights outside a hotel and you could see the lights off the body bodywork and so on. And then the other side uh, is the professional panels. I've been um, lucky enough to spend some time seeing some demonstrations with 
you know, the professional um, monitors that are used in studios. And again, those are able to hit the peak brightness levels. And there's just something about an HDR image that you see done right like that. Um, that does have the impact. But again, these are LCD based TVs. So we're talking about the, you know, the Dolby uh, Pulsar. Um, it's a dual layer LCD setup. Um, so there's plus and minuses. I, I guess the easy answer is there's plus and minuses for both technologies. Um, at the moment, if you were to ask me as a movie fan, as somebody that likes to watch movies in the dark, which technology I would prefer to watch on, I would pick, for, and this is being balanced, I would pick OLED at this moment in time, probably the HZ2000 from Panasonic. If you're um, watching a dark room. If I'm watching in a dark a room people, and so on. I've, I've certainly spoken to a lot of people who've said, you know, like watching Dolby Vision in particular on OLED, they say it looks too dark. And particularly it, if, daytime or... if your room is set up in a certain way and it's not set up for watching yeah. um, that type of material, it will look too dark. Um, that's why, you know, Dolby brought in IQ, which is supposed to, you know, sort of help that, that issue. But the same can be said for LCD, Steve. I've had LCD TVs in here from Samsung and, and other manufacturers where you have the same issue during the day with, with you know, a scene is set, supposed to look a certain way um, and graded a certain way, and it, and it can look exactly the same as it does on the OLED. So I don't have any preferences over one or the other. It's just uh, if I'm watching in a dark room, I think performance-wise for me at the moment, even though the, the color volume's not there and so on, I, I prefer the OLED approach at this moment in time because of the per pixel um, dynamic range that's, that's available. But you see a good bit of content on one of these Samsungs that can actually hit 2000 nits and you're watching content that's been you know mastered that way. It looks fantastic. It really does. There's, there's something to be said. So, so you know, micro LEDs a long way away at this moment in time, but a technology like that that can do the peak brightness um, and can also do the per pixel basis in terms of dynamic range, add those together, that's the holy grail. It's got to be the holy grail. And I think that's that's where we're going to see big changes, but that's still a way away at this moment in time. So, so yeah, that's my answer to that question. Sorry, I went on a bit, but mm. hopefully that... <laughs> Uh, and then another one, and I'm gonna I'm gonna insist that this one's done in a in a more pop a pop vox fashion. Um, I can't remember who actually asked it now because it's been so long since I. But um, the question was for uh, film viewing, LG CX or Philips? Which Philips was it? Did someone else pay attention to the questions? Or am I the only person reading the questions? I haven't had a chance to go through them. I've been busy. Oh, talking. well, it's on. It's just been cropping up on the bottom of the YouTube screen. It's whichever of the Philips OLEDs you've reviewed recently. Okay, so that was comparable the, with the. Eight, eight, that was eight oh five. The OLED eight oh five. 805. Yep. Yeah. Um, so what was the question? The T ten uh, or the yeah, Philips? Yeah, T ten or Philips for for film. Uh, you know, is filmmaker mode. Um, uh, an advantage for the LG over the Philips, or does whatever the Philips is calling the filmmaker mode? Right, well, the Phil out. Philips is, this is the confusing thing. It confused me. Um, I've also spoken to Danny Tack recently about it. So the filmmaker mode is on the Philips 805, uh, sorry, 850, but no, 805. But it didn't, it's not named. So it's actually under movie. I didn't know that when I reviewed the TV, so I just used the ISF modes as you would. Um, so if you have a, a 2020 TV, it does have filmmaker mode uh, on the Philips. It's under movie, it's not named. So that means everything should be switched off in movie mode and it should be quite accurate. The next Philips I get in, which should be the 935 and it should be in the next few weeks, I will double check that. They won't be named filmmaker mode until next year's TVs. So Danny's aware of it, Philips is aware of it. They're going to make that change. It won't be for this year. It'll be for next year. Um, was that the only question, or was it which one did I prefer? Which one would you then prefer? Uh, SDR, they're, they're very, very close in terms of picture quality. And In fact, I think you'd be hard-pressed, accurate, accurate calibrated, um, very, very similar SDR. There is a difference with HDR. The Philips is, has a higher peak brightness, uh, 700 and odd nits uh, compared to... 600 and something on, and this is just off the top of my head. I, I haven't got access to them. So the Philips is a bit brighter. Um, if you like your picture processing and so on, um, there's some nice stuff on the Philips. They've got a nice new movie mode. 
um, that they've changed that. It's uh, uh, cinema something or other. I can't remember. You know, I'm going to look it up, but it's got... Um, it's got the new modes on it for motion. Motion is is vastly improved. Um, it looks really nice. The one where it adds a little bit of interpolation, I can tell it's interpolating, but I don't know if um, normal members of the public would. In fact, normal members of the public would probably never notice it. But if you have got a keen eye like myself and Steve, I, I can always see interpolation when it's added. Um, but it's, it's good that they're adding these new modes in there. Um, and the one that does the correct 5.5 pull down, uh, with 24 frames per second material looks really, really good. So they're very, very close. Um, and I think in terms of smart TV, you know, Android's improved a hell of a lot. Mm. I know myself and Steve spoke, speak at length um, on these podcasts when, you know, the earlier Sonys were coming out and, and some of the Philips TVs and, and they were crashing and so on. Um, they don't do that anymore. They've sorted it out. They've got proper MediaTek processors in there. They've got enough RAM to... Uh, to be running it properly, and Android has has a good selection of apps. It has all the major selections on there as well. Um, so yes, Pure Cinema is the setting for motion for 24 frames content, and it does that uh, with the correct pull down. The movie mode, which used to do that, doesn't do that now. But movie mode adds a little bit of D blur in there, um, which Danny says gets around the uh, sample and hold of of OLED. Um, so it doesn't have the uh, that sometimes the, the little stutter that you can see with, with some OLED or some people can see it. Because again, motion comes down to how you perceive it. You know, people perceive it slightly differently. Um, the advantage that the LG has is that it has 120 hertz uh, black frame insertion. And I've got to say, I don't know if you've played a bit with it, Steve, this year, but in minimum and mid, um, with SDR, not HDR, because it That's does affect brightness. <laughs> vastly improves the motion. I mean, the, the LG looks a lot better with that. But again, SDR only. I wouldn't use it with HDR because no, it dims, it. dims the brightness. So, yeah, it's very, very difficult. I mean, a lot of these TVs, you are talking about tiny, tiny little differences. In other words, in choose the, the one where the details annoy you the least. Yeah, basically. Because, I mean, they've all got cracking smart TV and all the rest. Of the, the downside for LG is, unfortunately, the lost free view play. Um, freeview play was. I mean, I'm assuming they will did. put those back on it. Some well, iPlayer's back, so yeah, iPlayer so should follow so. suit. I mean, I think as, as a smart platform, WebOS is still the, the best. Yeah. Magic it, Remote's awesome, and it's got a complete set of yeah. services, apps. I mean, uh, I'm not sure that Android's got as many. The only uh, one that Android think, doesn't have is is Apple. Uh, no, as far it hasn't as got Apple. Now TV either, has it? Does it not? Okay. No, no, uh, no, no, no sure. TV, no Apples. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, I'm not sure about that. Well, mm. what, what off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Obviously, the other advantage with Philips is Ambilight. If you like Ambilight, if you like bias lighting, and we're going to come out in a bias lighting probably next week's podcast because Steve's had a nice little uh, uh, bias light sent to him from a company that does it for professional shoes and so on. So we'll come to that around next week. But Ambilight, if you like lights flashing, following the videos and so on and turning your, your living room into a nightclub, you can do that. Or you can use it as a bias light, set it to the ISF mode and it's a nice uh, bias light behind the screen that, that helps your eyes, stops you uh, feeling tired when you're watching, especially dynamic HDR content and so on. If you're a gamer, the Philips is not for you. So if gaming is a big thing, this is where things do to have a big difference, um, the uh, the input lag is a lot higher than the uh, than the LG. Um, so you're looking at 34 milliseconds, which was measured on our Meridio, um, compared to I think it's about 10 milliseconds, 11 milliseconds on the uh, on the LG. And of course, the LG has HDMI 2.1. The Philips doesn't have that, and it doesn't have any of the features. So it doesn't have ALLM or VRR or anything like that. Um, support which the LG does. So if you're into gaming, that's the one for you. Right. I feel like I've been talking all podcasts. Somebody else talk. Well, are we now? Uh, hey. Sorry. Yes. Music are choice we, of the week. Oh, fine. Are we? Are we switch? Are we segueing some video? No, no. Oh, yeah, is sorry. that all the questions? Is it? I thought there was more questions. Um, than that. Well, shall we go back to the... questions at the end of it? We've done some questions. We can do some more questions in a bit. Right. I okay. Feel we need to let Kaz talk. Okay. Oh, yeah. Mm. Kazi's on the podcast, isn't he? I forgot yeah. that. <laughs> uh, right. So hopefully that's the questions asked so far. We'll come back to those. That's hardware done. We'll come back with software in a sec.
I'm Gary. Uh, I didn't have any anything in my ear again, once again. But uh, yeah, moving on to software. So, Ed, movie choice of the week. Yeah, let's be brief about this one. Um, right, something a bit less pretentious than last week's um, uh, interpretive jazz. Uh, Asian Dub Foundation have released an album called Access Denied. Um, you could make a legitimate argument that Asian Dub Foundation has not necessarily changed anything in their sound from Enemy of the Enemy, which came out in 2002, but it's a good sound. Um, when they put a bit of anger into things, it's a genuine anger. You know, it's not it's not contrived. They, they are discussing subjects which mean things to them. Um, and it's it's tight. It's together. It. it you know, it, not every song is an act, is, is is perfect, but that goes back to the whole perfect album discussion from from a few months ago. It's a good listen, um, and they really have uh, put the uh, put the effort in. Um, it's on the streaming services. You can buy the album direct on Bandcamp, on CD, vinyl, or just buy the download if you want to support the artist directly. Uh, it's got a cameo by Stuart Lee on it obviously um and i i mean i know phil you listened to it earlier i just think it, it's it's got a it's got a bit of something to it. it it's got um you know it's a group of guys who've been at this for 25 years and it, there's still some that you know the experience pays under these circumstances yeah i w- one thing that stood out for me ed was um obviously the the whole movement that started up this year uh, blm and all the rest of it and mm. um I'm not going to say artists jump on the bandwagon or whatever, but what I felt listening to this was it was coming from the heart. It was they've been doing this for it, 20 years. They've been doing so, it for yeah. a long time, and and the points they wanted to make were personal to them, and and you got that. It wasn't like mm. they were reading somebody else's or singing somebody else's lyrics or whatever. It was like this this is their experience. They were getting it across. This is no. what how they feel and so on, which was genuine. Some of the tracks in the middle, I felt. It, it had a strong start. It it was a bit flabby in the middle. There was a few things I didn't like. It, um, I I don't I, I don't mind rap in a certain way because I, I, you know if it's done properly, good use of words and all the rest. It's an art. It's it's poetry. When it's done at hundred miles an hour. Yeah, um, I mean, but that's that's sort of essentially what they've always done. Um, I, I will I just just intersperse my favourite uh, anecdote about Asian Dub Foundation is that in two thousand and five they released an album called Tank, um, which includes a song called Tank, which starts where they take the basic framework of the wheels on the bus and sing the wheels on the tank. Um, And for long and complicated reasons, I was using that, I was listening to that quite a bit when my son was of a certain age and bless him for many years, he thought that the wheels on the tank is the correct version of the uh, of the of the of the song rather than the wheels on the bus which caused some surprise and consternation at his nursery group um so yeah that's so that's all good um it's also worth mentioning if the asian dub foundation is not your thing uh last night yesterday uh, uh afternoon time american time evening time for us fleet foxes released an album it's their fourth album they did it without any fanfare they said here's a new album uh, went out on the services it's called sure um the fleet foxes have a small problem in so much as their first album is very nearly perfect and as far as i'm concerned it's it, you know you can't you can't sort of encapsulate you can't beat that but it's a it's a nice listen it's a it, it's well worth it if you don't fancy um asian Dead foundation give give fleet foxes a whirl instead Okay, anybody else got some uh, music suggestions? Kaz, have you been listening to anything recently? I have. I mean, Ed, are you a fan of Orbital? Yes. Oh, love Orbital. So, so I uh, I mean, I, I say I'm a fan. I've been a big fan of them for, whatever, 30 years, and I completely missed their last album. Uh, what, only... uh, Monsters Exist? Yeah, I've only just discovered that, and it's, 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 a, it's, it's playing a... it on repeat. I absolutely love it. It's... The vinyl of that whoever pressed that is a genius that's that's teetering on the edge of 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 not tracking but it does it's absolutely fabulous so yes all very very good um uh the the brian cox end track i find is a slight i find i don't it's interesting but i don't feel it's it's i don't feel it's a suitable track to end the album but i thought it's it's it's, it's a good i thought it was their best effort in some in brian cox as in professor brian cox yeah as in professor brian yes it's well, it's quite not not drunken Irish actor Brian Cox. No. <laughs> yeah. Scottish, some, Scottish actor. Some, thank sorry. you very much. Yeah, 
it has some throwback to kind of the snivelization era for me i uh, well, no, but that's the whole title of it um uh monsters exist was one of the things that used to flash up on their um as one of the word sets that used to flash up on their display um uh during the live acts during the chime belfast era yes i remember that yes so there you go tenuous historical reference there so yeah i thought it had that vibe and it's the first time they've done that artwork since insides i think yes so um yeah i've been listening to that tremendous okay and we know steve's been listening to bowie dad rock and also um nick mason's source of secrets all right okay even though um, ed doesn't like it <laughs> I no, I was. I'll rephrase my disappointment. It's so rare to see childhood, childhood's end, get an outing anywhere in an, in any circumstances, and I just thought there was gash. But you know, you you may enjoy it. <laughs> so. Did you Did you have a listen to Manson after last week, Steve? I did. I remembered my favourite Manson track, which is Closer Business, which I think is fantastic, a okay. mighty song. Yeah, yeah. I love Manson. It's great. Uh, I need to search out more albums like that from the, from the past and uh, give it a blast because it was great. It was really good. Uh, right. Uh, music, that's music done. So uh, let's talk about movies. So um, let's do movie review first. I think I want to know about Enola Holmes. Uh, not spoilers, but... Um, I'm going to watch you off this podcast. Yeah, I, I'm going to watch it this week as well. Sure. Mainly on the back of the trailer, I think. It's one one trailer I've seen recently where I thought... I really want to watch that. And the reason I want to watch it is I thought Millie Bobby Brown comes across uh, really, really well. Um, yeah, it's worth watching for her, is the punchline. Right, okay. I mean, it's it's uh, it's flabby. It's Netflix, so they need to get an editor. It's a, it's a hefty two hours long. And it does right not need in, to be two hours, is it? <laughs> no, right in the middle, you, you just completely lose track of whatever kind of quest they're on. Uh, it gets off to a great start though, and pretty much every time she turns to the camera, it, it's she's absolutely captured. That's what I liked. That's what I liked about the it. the trailer was yeah. you know breaking the fourth wall. It, yeah, it's, is it's, is that done a lot through this, or is it just now and it again? It is, but as I it, as I say in the middle, it it kind of loses its way. It's funniest and sharpest at the beginning, and then at the end. And and um, Cavill's very good, and Claflin. Is good as well. I saw the three of them on, on Netflix, like six minute thing they did on, on YouTube, where they were discussing, they were being given various Victorian slang and had to try and work out what the hell it meant, which was really funny. And they had, the three of them had really good chemistry. And I looked up Millie Bobby Brown on IMDb, which probably means she's going to be dead next week. Um, <laughs> well, I hope not because she's only 16. And I thought, blimey, she's only 16. She she looked about 25 in the uh, in the things she did with um, with um, with um, Henry Clavel and um, Sam Claflin. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, good believe, good believe she's, she's, 16. she's tremendous. She's, she's, she's a producer a, on this. Yeah, that's a, what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Big <Hang> career <laughs> ahead of her, I think, as long as she doesn't go down that kind of odd child actor route of yeah, she's, she's, people like Dakota Fanning. And I mean, people who've, who've done well for themselves, but just not quite turned it into an, uh, you know, Millie yeah, Boy I, I think, seems to be I think very she's quite social media aware. Yeah, very she, social I, media she seems aware. to be really quite savvy, savvy. with this. I, I noticed uh, there was a thing on online. I don't know how true it was, but um, the, there's a petition going that, that if Lucasfilm ever make a Princess Leia film, that she should play the Carrie Fisher role. I just thought that was a bit odd. I don't see it myself. I don't. I don't even think she looks like her. So I don't know where that um, one came from. But I tell you, she looks. She always. I thought she looks like the spitting image of a young Winona Ryder to me. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, is it worth watching? Uh, you know what? I wouldn't stick it at the top of your list, but it's. It, I mean, if you like Millie Bobby Brown, <laughs> well, it's, it's free. Definitely, and I can watch it tonight. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> most a lot of people have caught up on everything there is on Netflix, and it, it's I it's haven't. a very watchable, enjoyable effort. And it's and unlike something like Devil All the Time, which is a superior movie, Ooh. this That's one's a grim two and a half hours. Yeah, exactly. I watched this one's at least a, a light, enjoyable romp, and. Um, uh, yeah, she's she's absolutely brilliant in it, and you know, you Stranger had to be Things fans, that's <laughs> you know, you're gonna you're gonna enjoy us. Okay, so. uh, Tesla, the uh, is this no, a film not about worth the anyone's this... time? Yeah, just go okay. and watch the five minutes of David Bowie and the Prestige, yeah. <laughs> and understand that Nolan had a vision for these guys weren't 
scientists they were magicians and rock stars and yeah yeah that's how he <laughs> viewed tesla this is this is tesla the electric engineer and um it's it's tedious uh, Becky, on the other hand, is tremendous and comes highly recommended, not least for a really fierce and scary performance from Kevin James, which I, are words I don't think Kevin I ever thought I'd say. <laughs> you know, I'm, oh, yeah, I'm not talking about grown-ups here. So he's he's terrifying. He's uh, a neo-Nazi um, kingpin, and he terrorizes this young family and the I don't know, like 13 year old girl has to find a way to fight back the titular Becky. Is it worth she's... watching interspersed with episodes of the King of Queens just to really <laughs> discombobulate you? It's it's worth watching grown ups right before to just to just to show how jarring the difference is. But I mean he's tremendous in it. And it's a it's a properly gory um horror survival thriller. Where is thing. it? What's... Digital coming out next Monday, so you have to have to wait a few more days. But it it was very pleasantly surprising. Ninety three minutes, I approve of that. Yes, yeah, nice <laughs> tight ninety minutes is what well, I like. You to say hear. that, but Tesla's about eighty minutes, and yeah, okay, it, I know yeah, seventy five minutes it, it, too long. It's <laughs> not it's not foolproof, but yeah. it's it's just heartening yeah. in the in this this point where two hours is somehow normality to see people get a story done. In yes. 90, 93 well, minutes. Netflix need to learn that because yeah. they seriously need to do more 90 minute stuff. Oh, I just think that everyone should be made to hours. sit down in front of The Running Man, which is what, 89 <laughs> minutes? And it it just goes like the clappers from start to finish. It's brilliant. It's, it, it, you know, it's a demonstration of how much you can get done in 89 minutes. Um, Netflix so, so definitely the, need to hire some more editors because they, they have do. a bad habit of padding out series with episodes that don't need to be there or. They make them an hour long when they could have been 40 minutes. But, but would you say that it, with the Irishman or did you like... Oh, God, the Irishman. I mean, that's three and a half hours. It didn't even be that long. I mean, if he was making that film for theatrical release, there's no way that Scorsese would have released yeah. it at three and a half hours. No, there's, there's no, no, he no, just stu felt, no studio would do that because you can't make money on well, it. No, exactly. He, he just thought, well, it's on Netflix, so there's no time limit. I'll, I'll go as long yeah. as I like. <laughs> yeah. um, sometimes, you know, you know, that's fine. Sometimes you can be in a world where you know, I don't want to leave this world. I'm, I'm happy to stay here for a bit longer. But, um, you know, you were thinking that some of the actors in The Irishman might die of old age before the film had finished. <laughs> <laughs> Actual jeopardy involved. <laughs> were you looking them up on IMDb whilst watching it? <laughs> look up. I'm not going to look at Robert De Niro on IMDb. I'll kill him. <laughs> well, I'll tell you who, uh, who was uh, trending on Twitter when I got up that morning. Tom Baker and I was like... Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! And check, no, he's still alive. But... <laughs> Christopher Lee was trending today, and it's like, what? Did he come back? Um... <laughs> just... I'll, I'll take your word for it on on Tom Baker, Phil, um, Phil, because I don't want to look him up. Just no, <laughs> no, no you, you stay away from my. Own yeah, news. stay away from it. Uh, before we move on to uh, film and TV news, um, like I say, if you're watching us this evening on the video, uh, or if you're watching us on YouTube later in the week, please hit that like button. It really does help us out. Um, the more likes the video gets, the higher it climbs up. Uh, the search listens and so on. We can find new people. We can bring them in and join them into our community here. Um, and of course, you can join us on patreon.com forward slash AV forums and make a monthly donation of three pounds. And you get little uh, uh, bonuses if you do that. You get to see Tom nice and early with these Tom's Thumbs videos and so on. And we're going to add more to that. Uh, so if you want to do that, then please do. Or if you want to watch, uh, watch, if you want to ask us a question this evening uh, before we wrap up, or if you listen during the week and want to ask a question, uh, you can do that. You can make a donation via streamlabs.com forward slash AV forums, um, ask a question, and you can donate any amount that you like, and uh, we will read them out. If you do that during the week, we'll read them out on the next podcast. Uh, or if you are listening to the audio only version via Spotify, iTunes, or any other provider, you can get in touch via podcast at avforums.com. Ask us a question uh, or just give us a general feedback. It is appreciated. Right. So uh, moving on, uh, right. film news this week. So we we're talking about more films being delayed. Well, we knew this one was going to be delayed, didn't we, Steve Black Widow? Yeah, but it only just got announced. I mean, yeah, it's today. interesting because uh, Mulan made a, well, supposedly made a lot of money. But I mean, you, you could have got a Disney exec and you could have interviewed him and said, was Mulan big? And they could have gone, yeah, it's a, as big as a sperm whale blowhole. 
it wouldn't have made any difference because the reality was the only way that the, the proof that Mulan had done well would be if they released anything else. The well, they might they still st- release Soul. Well, I think Soul I could well get a uh, release, but they were never going to release Black Widow on, on Disney+. Plus. They've no, got an intricately know. planned never. out if MCU. They really, if they These really have to made... be cinema releases. No, if they really made enough money with Mulan, they could conservatively double it on something as popular. Casual, you're, forgetting, you're forgetting something. Nothing's in production. They, they've shifted everything across the year, basically. So now Black Widow's coming out in May and the Eternals are coming out in November. And that buys them time to actually make the rest of the stuff. Sure. Plus, I, I mean, um, I, I think they'd have, they'd have lapped up half a, mi- half a billion this year if they could really make that money. But I think they can't well, make not if money. it leaves a gape. Not if it, it does yeah. leave gaping holes. Not they've got a gaping hole in their they're, schedule. But they're they, going to have a gaping hole in their bank balance while they're waiting for money for all these films. But well, no, Disneyland well, is back open, and the resorts are <laughs> no. I'm not. I'm, the resorts are back open. Um, well, there was there was a Reuters article suggesting that their sub renewals because they come they're into renewal heading to renewal phase for um, in the US. Yeah, in the US is holding up quite nicely. I don't think, and also, um, it just the nature of them, the nature of of uh, of aggressive takeovers and stuff seems to just be cooled at the moment whilst people work out what's happening election post-election stuff like that i don't think they feel that they're in the firefighting frame of mind that they might have thought that they were a couple of months ago yeah i mean you know the pressure point here is that they they need to have content to release and if the if it means that they can move things around now's the time to move things around um not release stuff now and then find out that they've, they've got a big gaping hole in their schedule so i think Steve hits a nail on the head, really, that um, they can move stuff now. They're going to make some, they're going to lose money. They're going to lose money anyway. Um, so they may as well take the hit now, move stuff, get stuff into production, and then um, look to move it that way. Now, do we believe that it made $260 million? I'm talking about no. Mulan here on, on Disney+. Plus. I Not in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Well, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't take much to make $260 million out of the it, it was a 9 million. million. 9 million subscribers in the States out of possibly 30 million. 60, That's, I thought it was worldwide. Yeah, no, but um, this was just for the States. So it made 260 million in the States, uh-huh. which is equivalent to 520 million at the box office. So if you compare that to the paltry 30 million that tenants made, then, you know, that's a blinder on the part, isn't it? <laughs> if they've done that business worldwide, you know, um, maybe 500 million worldwide, then that's... Um, that's a billion dollar movie, isn't it? Basically, yeah. And let's be honest: happened. if it had opened in the cinema, it wouldn't have made anything like that. No. So, uh, I, I think that was a good call. I think if it has made decent money, they'll probably put. I think Soul could well end up coming out before the end of the year because, you know, it's a Pixar movie. It'll sell. You know, it'll go down well um, with uh, with the Disney Plus subscribers. Um, and I think they've got another. I mean, I think they've got enough coming out next year that they can put something else out before the end of the year, just to give Disney Plus a boost. So uh, if, if because they, they haven't got it. much else really. I mean, there's One Division and the second season of The Mandalorian, but the Falcon and Winter Soldier has been pushed back to next year, which is another reason why they need to push the films back because they're meant to be connected with the TV series. Bizarrely, One Division is meant to be connected with um, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, which isn't out for two years, so at least. <laughs> At least two years, but um, yeah. did anyone watch the One Division trailer? No, no, it's odd. It's it looks... yes, it's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it's it, it is interesting. Uh, it, it could be good. Um, it could be interesting. Um, but I don't think it's going to be. You know, it's not the kind of thing that's going to get in tons of subscribers at Disney Plus. I don't think. Uh, and also, the Mandalorian. Did you watch the Mandalorian? We mentioned the Mandalorian trailer last week, didn't we? Um, yeah. the Mandalorian. Apparently, um, <laughs> Pedro Pascal. <laughs> was getting pissed off with not being able to take his helmet off and show his face. Which is fair enough. I mean, if you're an actor and you're in a big show, you kind of want people to know who you are. Um, but but then so again, you're, that, you're quite easy to replace, though, aren't you? Well, <laughs> apparently. So I thought the first season of Mandalorian, it was basically just a stuntman most of the time. He just did a voiceover and, and it showed up to show his face at the end. But apparently it was him in the suit a lot of the time. And that, so they're half of the production on season two and he's in the suit and he's going, like, can I take my helmet off? And they go, no. <laughs> goes, but no, can't take my helmet off. no so eventually he went to lucas who was on the set and said can i take my helmet off and uh they said look i think you should go home so uh they packed him off home and um they shot the second half of the season with the stunt man and he's just doing a voiceover and apparently that's what he's going to be doing for season three and four 
Yeah. Oh. Okay. Well, uh, hence, hence John Favreau's comments about oh, were more storylines for different characters, and yeah, I think they're trying well, to expand the show. I, I had a rumor today, or read a rumor today, that Boba Fett's turning up in this one. So well, I have a man; his dog's turning up now. Is it really? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's um, going to go one of two ways, really, isn't it? It's either going to work really quite well, or it's or it's fan appeasement. And we don't want wait. any more fan appeasement. Let's see if Jar Jar Binks puts an appearance. I'd <laughs> love it if Jar Jar Binks turned up. <laughs> Excellent. Only He's to a die. <laughs> no, no, no. Like they could finally fulfill his potential as the Sith Lord he was supposed yeah, to be. I, I, I love that premise. I thought that is just genius. That is. It really he is. did bring down the entire Republic by starting he the did. Clone War. Yeah, he, he did. did. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It was his he suggestion. Did. He's the one that put forward the, the idea of um, you know, creating an army. So uh, sure, it's his yeah. fault. So it's he's his a, a Sith Lord. Definitely. That was always yeah. the plan. When they it, it, interesting that you mentioned Lucas here, because there's been a, a lot of talk on the inter- interwebs about Lucas being more involved now with Lucasfilm and, uh, you know, Kathleen Kennedy stepping back and, and looking at where... Stepping back is a nice way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exact. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that was the wordage that was used. It was, uh, they are stepping back, or she was stepping back. Yeah, to, to spend more time with her family, presumably. <laughs> right. Well. <laughs> yeah, no, they can't suck her. But uh, once her contract's up, she'll be gone. Right. Okay. No, no, that's Steve's Apparently opinion, Fa- obviously. Favreau and uh, Filoni are calling the shots at the moment. Right. But seemingly Lucas is is getting quite a bit... They've, they've actually turned back to him now and saying, look, what do you Help. think? Give us some input here. So, oh, yeah, be interesting. The, the other bit of news was uh, it's rumoured that Tom Hardy is the new Bond after this... Uh, Latest film, if well, it, I mean, once when again, it ever comes out, yeah, yeah he's not, <laughs> yeah, not going to be November. Yet. I can tell you that much. No, no, no. <laughs> once again, Danny Dyer has been snubbed, and I think that that's terribly unfair. <laughs> but um, <laughs> come on, he'd be an amazing Bond, absolutely amazing. I mean, you effing Muppet. Um, <laughs> the, but, the reality is that Tom Hardy kind of auditioned for Bond way back in Inception. When he was, uh, or Tinker was, Tailor Soldier Spy, when he plays a sort of down at his heel really, Bond. Yeah, and in, and Inception, when he <laughs> did, he did land Bond. He did the whole snow sequence in Inception. I mean, it was a, it was a very Bondian movie, uh, in, at least as in so far as his character is concerned. I mean, he's done a lot of mumbling since. But it's pretty par for the course that they wait until it's ten years after the sell by date to actually recruit a bond. But it, it's it? interesting you said sell by date. Has Bond reached its sell by date? Well, I, don't, I mean, Bond will never. I mean, the money it makes, it'll never reach its sell by date. They'll always bring it back. But what I mean is, they've got a habit for hiring an actor ten years after they actually should have hired him. I mean, they did it in, with Moore Brosnan. And, How old is he now? And he's forty-two. Is he? Something like that. Well, that's a doable he's, ten years. I know, but he's forty-three. He's forty-three, but he's older than Craig was when Craig started, and he won't actually release a film for two, three years. I'm guessing. I mean, they're not yeah, going to get it off not, the hire someone in their early thirties. They, they, really, they do because if you want a few films out of him, he's gonna he's gonna be mooring it by the end, much like Craig's doing. I mean, they complained about Craig being too old. What three films into his movie? Well, after, after the first one, he's he's more or less phoned it in, hasn't he? He hasn't been interested, really. I mean, they had to pay him a huge amount of money to get this one made, didn't they? It was 50 odd million. I think he was he was quite engaged when it came to Skyfall, but uh, he phoned it in for Seth Spectre. Yeah, yeah. who wouldn't? Yeah. <laughs> this one, I don't know. I mean, does anyone here think that film's coming out in November? No, no, no. no. And neither's but Wonder Woman, Dune, no, none Wonder of this stuff. Night. They're all going to get shipped, pushed back to next year now. There's no point. Tenants proved without the cinemas, unless the cinemas are all open, even if they're open, people aren't going to go. It's, they're not going to make any money. But yeah, if they don't, don't put films don't know, out, they, I think Tenant will make money, but it will make money in the long game. It's the cinemas that will lose. Well, money. only because there's nothing else in the cinema to, yeah, to, to exactly. compete with. It. So, so if you play it for six months, it's going to make its money back. But yeah, for six cinemas months, I'm still going to watch it collapse. <laughs> yeah, I don't. The, the cinema chains can't survive on tenant for six months. No, no, there'd yeah. be like three people per showing. But the, the, it's probably better off for them if they just shut up and wait for those, those yeah. films to show again because they, they haven't got to, you know, if you've got to pay rent, obviously. But yeah, other but than that, no, there's you know, no furlough scheme this time around, so God only knows what they're supposed to do. Um, well, you sack everyone and rehire them when there is a reason oh, to. Oh, well, um, yeah. That's ideal because obviously it's, it's a well-known phenomenon that people people be talk, just waiting for their jobs to reappear don't eat. Um, but yeah, um, 
I was I t- talking about it from the perspective of the, the cinema chains, not for the poor people that are working for them. Well, clearly, but um, it, 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 there, there's no. Happy, I, I agree with you. I don't think anything else is coming out because it, it's been a. Um, it's, it's it's not been a success. Tenant has been a disaster in the states. It has not generated. I mean, because most of the major markets aren't open, and um, you know now that the other part, rest of the world, starting to shut down again. It's it's just uh, there is no point opening a major budget movie at the cinema right now. Yeah, so let's move on to TV that we can watch at home. Yes, because <laughs> um, we're going to be spending lots of time at home. Uh, like so, <laughs> so Kaz, uh, what have you been looking at recently? Uh, I saw um, Ratchet, which is based on the. Um... Is it, is that actually part of American Horror Story? <sighs> no, it isn't. I'm no, just, it's just calling the same. it Ryan Murphy, because... isn't it? my god it's ryan murphy and it is more american horror story than it is one flew over the cookies nest i mean it, it it's not it's not the character from one i don't think anyone was crying out for a series based upon the nurse in one flew over sure, the cuckoo's absolutely. Nest. but if you were gonna make one i mean it's just like they i put in the review they've announced a series about a prequel to robocop um, yeah with none of the robot about robocop, robocop. So it's just called no, it's, it's just called cop. Dick Jones. yeah that's exactly what i suggested <laughs> just, call it they Dick. just call it cop <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so I mean, it's like that. Who who wanted to know about this nurse? But if they were going to make a show about this nurse, they possibly could have started with she was normal and committed to helping people and got slowly um, jaded in her job and perhaps under the abuse of her patients until she eventually became who she was in One Foot Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which is someone whose power's gone to their head and who's obviously very cold. In this, she's just a serial killer. Right, you mean psycho. it's like that, you, sort of like that psycho prequel, you know, where Norman Bates starts. No, I don't know. That works though, because yeah. that shows, yeah, yeah, that that shows his history and that shows him slow burning it into this. This she walks in as a psycho, absolutely. Much, it's not a psychopath in one's one of one, one, one now. She's just uh, one is she's she buries like five bodies in the first half yeah, season. I'm not interested oh, in splendid. it. So it's American Horror Story. It's not it's not Ratchet. And I think that American Horror Story fans might get some might get some time out of it because it does have that sort of sumptuous visuals and it has Paulson in the lead. You know, it is it's in that in all but name. Um but yeah it's I, I was very disappointed and shocked that they that they went so over the top. Um I have dabbled with uh, Brave New World, which was a little bit disappointing, uh, but I'll do a full review of that closer to the time. Can you can you tell us a little bit more about it? The old, sure. The I mean, it's based on Aldous Huxley's book, and and which posited some interesting ideals, and it shows a future where everyone pops a pill to re- remain emotionally intact, and where uh, you can't have monogamous relationships you can basically sleep with anybody oh, right i saw the trailer for this it's a sky production isn't it yeah it, it's i mean it's it's interesting and of course they they've got like the savage lands which is a bit like westworld where you go and visit these people who uh, believe in religion and marriage and such savagery as you know only, yeah get, getting married and only sleeping with one person i mean it's that's those are their examples of savagery and um it's it's an an interesting kind of positive utopia because normally these utopian productions they they show that it's really a very cracked veneer this one they they play the long game and it actually looks like a very happy place to live um i appreciate that <laughs> Popping well, no religion, great loads news, of drugs, but... and lots of sex. I'll take yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, that it doesn't. There's, there's a, <laughs> there are a lot of orgies. They're, they're very, very. You sound, very sound wearied. Uh, have you, have you, are you, are you, are you bored of orgies, Kaz? Uh, one an episode. <laughs> you should have. You, you buried the lead. Much. You should have started with orgies. No, I watch it. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> I, I'm assuming that, that you're stalling, getting ready for the uh, televisual highlight of the week, uh, indeed the month, which is uh, Great British Bake Off. Uh, no, I'm not. But I have also caught uh, Raised by Wolves. Wait, what's that on? Okay. Uh, Channel 4, Steve. Great British Bake Off. Raised by Wolves. No, raised is... by Wolves. I couldn't give her monkeys about <laughs> is Great British Bake Off. On HBO Max, which isn't available in the UK. And, uh, right. No so how are you that. watching it then? You I'm, know how he's watching it. I'm, he's been a naughty boy. I am watching it via contacts in America. 
Well, the um, thing is, oh, what, someone, someone's holding their FaceTime phone up to yeah, the screen. Am, is yeah. that what it is? Yeah. So. Yeah. I, well, I mean, I, I used to actually go to America and watch stuff there, so I, I feel like I've done that. <laughs> the Raised by Walls base is going to be on at some. Yeah, point we, we don't have the budget HBO. for you to do that anymore. Okay? It's never <laughs> ever going to come up on anything decent because it's too good. No, be on now, won't it? Yeah. So like, exactly. It's going to be like the crap. Justice League cuts, but anyway, it's excellent and it's the best thing Scott's done in years it's uh it's prometheus without any of the alien kind of entanglement uh very high concept um so has scott just moved to jordan <laughs> everything he shot seems to be in the wadi rum these days well, wh whatever it is i mean he's done a great job it looks tremendous and it's it's a very expansive land now you see if you're looking at the live video at the minute stuart stopped on the, on a frame there and when I first saw it, I thought it was Galaxy Quest, you know, the, the little aliens. <laughs> when I first saw it now, I thought it was based upon the book by Caitlin Moran. I thought, wow, really Scott's well, making oh, oh, what, the, ch the comedy set in Wolverhampton? The Raised by Wolves. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just, it's the shot in the trailer. I have watched the trailer and I didn't know what it was when it came on. And when I saw the little blue, it, it's kids dressed, something, but it looked like the, uh, the, the, the planet they go to on uh, Galaxy Quest. It's hilarious. Anyway, are we caught up? Uh, is that all TV, cars? Sure, yeah. So, Ed, what have you been watching? Well, uh, as I haven't watched it yet, after this, you'll be watching films. I'm going to watch uh, last night's episode of Great British Bake Off. Um, otherwise, in terms of new television, I'm just not bothering. I just, I, it, I, you know, music is the focus at the moment, so I'm dipping in and out of old telly across. I, I've decided to start paying more attention to the back catalogue of stuff on Channel 4, because I've been ignoring that for quite a long time. And I'd forgotten that there's stuff like Smack the Pony and things like that. Oh, I love Smack the Pony. Grossly underrated comedy series. Yes, yeah, I love that. Um, but uh, no, I enjoy... I mean, obviously, uh, Great British Bake Off has the same issue that MasterChef has, that the standard that the contestants are being held to now the person that goes out in the first week of this season would have probably made it to the last three or four of the first season that's just the, the nature of how they've stepped up the competition and that's been the case for master chef the master chef the professionals and all the rest of it uh which means that it's ever further away from being something where you think yeah i could try that um but um, it's still, I still find it good television. And then um, again, it's not going to get anyone's pulses racing, but it, it, in terms of good ideas for ways to not become an enormous grotesque, you know, blimp as we aren't being able to move around as much, uh, the Eat Well for Less series with Greg Wallace and the chap who I do a disservice by forgetting his name it's just more reality television but at the very least it's reality television where they are pointing out ways that your food how you can go further yeah. with your budget and actually not die of you know heart failure in the next three to four weeks yeah I mean it, one, one of the things that has happened with lockdown is that I've been obviously stuck in the house like everybody else has but the only uh, other thing in the house with me is my fridge and uh, and obviously I, I've <laughs> I lost a I lost a stone before we went into lockdown, and I put it straight back on again um, with a little bit extra on top since lockdown started. So, like you, Ed, I have actually been uh, trying to rather than looking at comfort food for the autumn, I'm trying to get myself back into into the swing of things and try and get some of this uh, weight off. I'm terrified of being stuck in lockdown again with my fridge. No, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, I just, I essentially, I, all I do is make sure that it, just stuff is in the house to, that's that's there to be eaten and nothing else. But um, it, I always find that that's a good program. It's got some interest. It's always got some good ideas. Um, and if you do fancy something a bit more of a blowout thing, Netflix has got the Great American Barbecue Challenge, uh, which has got one bloke. I don't, know, I, I don't know how you can watch these things and not get hungry and then want to go and make the stuff. That's uh, I can never well, no, understand with, food TV. Barbecuing, no, barbecuing programs. It's okay. if you're watching it in the middle of the night, given that everything's a nine-hour cook, it's sort of a bit, <laughs> a bit irrelevant. Um, I do like the fact that um, there's one bloke who is from such a deep and distant part of the deep south. He's got subtitles. He's speaking in English, <laughs> but he's got subtitles. Uh, and the only time I've seen that before was well on that hyperdrive series that Netflix had, where. Um, uh, there was a bloke from Birmingham who also had subtitles because they couldn't understand what he was saying, which I thought was wonderful. So um... right, Stevie, you've been watching Hang on on the box. Uh, yeah, I uh, I've been watching Away, 
I know Kaz is already. You, did you review it, Kaz? Away? No, I didn't actually. I think that was uh, Kamari watched away. I think yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, I, n- I never. After her review, I promptly went away. I I because I'm a bit of a space nut. So they do they do some things correctly, but they also do a lot of stuff wrong, which really not winds me up. Plus, there's way too much. Uh, you know stuff about their families, which I couldn't give a monkey's about. Like, the mission to Mars is the main thing, right? Yeah, you don't want you don't want the emotional human no. aspect. It's not that. <laughs> Just get to Mars. Um, but get your but ass the, to Mars. Looks, it, get your ass to Mars. Yeah, it, it, but it looks great. Um, I've been watching the boys. I've got to say, losing interest fast in the boys. It's just not going to go anywhere, is it? I mean, they're meant to be killing superheroes, and they've done one superhero so far, and that was the beginning of the last season. Um, I, I just, what, are you still into the boys, Kaz? Uh, I am going to wait until it's all dropped and then binge uh, it because I'm not into once a week. Because I feel feel that like I might lose steam that way. I quite like to binge shows. Uh, I find that stuff that's on once a week. I, I'm totally with you on that one, Kaz. I, I can no longer do the uh, wait the week to for the next episode. It's it utterly, utterly unnecessary for the boys. No reason why they. Yeah, I don't. Be. I don't understand why Amazon are doing that because nobody does a monthly subscription for Amazon. They just pay that one some year fee. Yeah, it doesn't it, it? doesn't make any sense. And also, nobody subscribes to Amazon for their video content. No, no. So it's just, to get so it's just a perk. Them. So if you're going to give them a perk, don't eke it out. You can have your Christmas present, but I'm going to eke it out till March. Did you watch oh. uh, the Challenger Last Flight thing, Steve? I did. I'm sorry, Phil. Yes, yet. I I came my way through that, um, and also watched the. Duchess, which was the show that um, Catherine Ryan did. Right. Is it good? Um, it's okay. It's okay. It's funny. It's, it's actually quite funny in places. I just found her character a little bit annoying. Um, yeah, I just find her a little bit. She grates well, on me. I mean, she's basically something. playing herself. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not watching uh, But cha- the Challenger documentary was excellent. That was really, yeah. really good. I mean, it, it, I, I knew the story. I've seen and you'll be the same. You'll, have, you'll, have, you'll know all the I did. Well, I didn't, I didn't know that they knew. <laughs> that, did, well, did I, I didn't realise... I did All not right. know that the people that made the solid fuel boosters were telling them from uh, oh, years yeah, 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 yeah. that yeah, you were going to blow up at some point if you yeah, don't yeah, 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 do something absolutely. about it. There, there was a, uh, a, a, you know, back to air crash investigation again, but there was uh, that type of program on Discovery, I watched it a number of years ago, that went into the, the whistleblower and actually he was on it. I think he's since passed away, if I've... I may be wrong Norton, on that one. Norton Fire Cell, isn't it? Yeah. Like, it was, Norton, uh, Norton Fire Cell. I mean, to me, they, it's a weird one because for a period of time, <coughs> it, it, I haven't watched the documentary yet, but for a period of time, they, they uh, you know, the pushback was that they they were the villains of the piece. Um, but it's there's there's sort of a bit more ambiguity to that. And it, they weren't the villains of the piece at all. They, they actually said, no. "Do not launch yeah. uh, in, when the weather's cold." But, but then, NASA, and, but then NASA put the pressure on and they put the thumbs on them and yeah. they 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 bottled it. Um, but to be honest, it was completely NASA's fault, and they knew exactly what they were doing. And they were trying to meet arbitrary deadlines and and launch a shuttle every you know every two weeks or every month, and it was just unrealistic. And, yeah. and they killed seven people because of it. Yeah. Yeah, but it's uh, well in, the same way, in the same way they knew they had a problem with the uh, with the uh, the tiles as well. Um, Columbia, yeah, they knew about Columbia. that. Yeah, well, um, yeah. but it's worth watching, uh, and it's yes, a it's, it's a it's, it's a mini good. series. So I think there's five episodes. Four episodes, yeah. Four. and you can you can binge it in about three hours. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I watched it one did. afternoon. It was, yeah, yeah, it's really good. Right, I think that wraps up on TV. Quickly, we're going to do this because it's end of the month next week, Carl. So we're going to do the best of us. But what have you been looking at? Sure, I was looking at uh, funny um, but unlikely good bed- bedfellows, uh, Full Metal Jacket and Whiplash. So, uh, That's a back to back to Kanji with, isn't it? Yeah, it's quite interesting. <laughs> I mean, I know one's a war film and one's a film about drumming, but they're both about utter psychopaths and, um, and about, well, kind of torturing I, genius, I do maintain but... that the final scene of whiplash is still one of the best multi-channel test sequences that has ever been released it, it's i still use the the blu-ray but I still use it for tests and again it is well, it's, it's very very it's good. interesting this has got an atmos upgrade so um you see it was more the fact that there's a single piece at the end in the caravan sequence there's a piece where miles teller hits the kick drum and it's about 20 strikes inside of three to four seconds and a decent subwoofer will produce those as 20 separate strikes and a rubbish one just goes 
yeah, yeah. Um, and it's as simple it is as simple as that and then obviously you've just got lots and lots of very well recorded lovingly lovingly mastered instruments yeah. being played correctly it, it you know it's all very well saying all oh, the spaceship didn't sound realistic that is a, 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 real high, quali a high quality selection of real instruments being played yeah. being played extremely well yeah, yeah, most, not quite my people. tempo no no no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you know everybody has uh it knows what a certain instrument should sound like so it is it's uh, it's a good good test right uh so Wait, Kaz, Kaz, a quick yes. question Kaz, so has drive been announced then drive has been announced on 4k blu-ray uh, with some appalling that, artwork another, but it's amazing news completely overrated film in my opinion yeah well, well on that, on like that <laughs> yeah right so anyway <laughs> I, I know how to push Kazzy's buttons, that's it. Right, so uh, Full Metal Jacket is up on the homepage. Whiplash is going to be when, Kaz? Monday. So Monday. before then. Yeah, okay. And uh, don't forget, uh, Tom's Thumbs, uh, there is a new episode up there on our YouTube channel. If you haven't watched it yet, it's uh, the Netflix episode, so it's everything coming up on Netflix in October. Uh, so go and give that a watch if you haven't watched it yet. Uh, leave us your feedback, leave us a like, and uh, let us know what you think of the content. And uh, there should be another video in the next week or so uh, covering all the other uh, streaming services for October. So that's Tom's Thumbs. Uh, go and watch that. Uh, if you've enjoyed tonight's podcast, please do like the video. If you're watching at the moment or if you're watching uh, later in the week, uh, please hit the like button. It really does help uh, us climb up the uh, the search listings. It brings more people into uh, finding us, basically, listening to the podcast, watching the podcast, and, and hopefully visiting AV forums and getting involved with uh, the AV community over there, whatever uh, their interests may be or whatever your interests may be. Uh, of course, you can also donate. Uh, thank you very much for the donations tonight. The fine 306 to 85 pounds. Thank you. Uh, son of SJ, Ken, thank you very much for your five pounds. And Fergie B, thank you very much. Another five pound donation there. We've answered all your questions uh, that came along with that. And that is the best way to get your questions answered. If you uh, send us your question and maybe a small little donation, uh, you can do that streamlabs.com forward slash AV forums. Or if you want to do it on a more permanent basis and, and uh, donate monthly, you can do that via patreon.com forward slash AV forums. Um, and it's three pounds a month to do that. So thank you if you are supporting us. And thank you for listening before we finish we have the podcast competition cars sure to enter the podcast exclusive com competition to win a eureka blu-ray bundle use the following question to select the correct answer on the competition page which of these titles is directed by martin scorsese Okay, that's a question. Um, you need to go to AV Forums now and uh, look at the competition page and uh, you should be in with a chance of winning that prize. So that's it for the podcast this week. Uh, I've had a quick look through uh, the chat. I think we're up to date with all the questions that were yeah, in the I chat. I can't see any outstanding questions yeah. that we haven't already answered. So. so if you've taken the time to ask questions and uh, use the chat facility, um, thank you very much for joining us on the live stream. Uh, if you're watching us later in the, or listening to us later in the week, thank you again. And your feedback is appreciated. Podcast at avforums.com. Uh, so that's it this week. My thanks to Steve Withers. Real estate is a hobby of mine, actually. Ed Selly. Damn you people, go back to your shanties. And Kaz Harlow. You could trouble me for a warm glass of shut the hell up. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. You can bookmark avforums.com for latest reviews, news, and video. And of course, why not leave us a five star rating on iTunes? But only do that if you've enjoyed the show. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for watching and listening yet again. And we'll see you again next Wednesday. <laughs>